Ladies and gentlemen, good morning and uh, welcome to what promised to be a very interesting uh, session to begin this day. It is my honor and pleasure to coordinate the discussion today among eminent personalities of European policy making and the academia on the uh, topical issue of the prospects of the uh, European economy. The panelists here will be Mr. Jean-Claude Trisset, European uh, Chairman of the Trilateral Commission and uh, Chairman of the Board of Directors of the Bruegel Institute, former uh, President of the European Central Bank, Mr. Pierre Gramegna, Minister of Finance of Luxembourg, and Mrs. Maria de Mergi, Deputy Director of uh, Bruegel uh, Institute uh, in Belgium. And what a timely instance this is to discuss about the prospects of the European uh, economy as the continent emerges from the deepest uh, post-war recession uh, with the euro area economy having contracted by 6.6% last year, the, euro, uh, the European uh, 27 uh, area contracted by 6.1%, and with the European Commission only yesterday releasing its, its uh, uh, most recent uh, forecasts for uh, a, a revised upwards uh, uh, real GDP uh, uh, expansion forecasted for 21 in the area of 4.3% and another expansion for 22 or 4.4%. Uh, obviously, the revision upwards has been on the, on the grounds of the contribution of the NGU funds uh, to growth. However, despite uh, this dynamic comeback of the Euro European economy expected, uh, longer term and more structural uh, challenges remain and some of them hopefully will be uh, the focus of today's uh, discussion. Many questions on the outlook of the, of the region uh, are, are topical uh, today, and our session will try to shed light on questions such as what are the uh, economic prospects for the region in the medium term, uh, given that at least at an initial stage the recession has been deeper and the recovery shallower uh, than both the global economy and the U.S. economy. And uh, when do we expect uh, the European economy to reach its pre-crisis level? Another question regards whether uh, the possibility of, of lasting scars remaining in potential GDP growth rates as a result of the pandemic and uh, related disturbances or, by contrast, whether the NGEU and, in particular, the Resilience and Recovery uh, Fund as well as the uh, multi-annual financial framework, the structural funds of the European uh, Union, will present uh, a unique opportunity for reforming uh, Europe's growth model, not just boosting uh, demand, uh, or whether the funds is just one of the parameters uh, of the equation of future growth, and pro-growth structural reforms are at least uh, uh, equally uh, important. If the latter, which most likely is, uh, is the case, what reforms uh, have the, uh, the, the most uh, uh, impact on growth prospects and are politically more feasible uh, to implement? Uh, is NGEU a kind of a precursor uh, for uh, fiscal, more fiscal integration in the euro area, or it should be viewed as a one-off event? Uh, regarding challenges, uh, the stretched fiscal positions of most euro area uh, member states and uh, southern uh, ones in particular uh, and elevated debt levels which have been further increased uh, by the fiscal support measures undertaken as part of the pandemic response uh, obviously will be a, a, a focal point uh, for policy makers in the years to come what are the best uh, ways to deal with that and finally Given the continuous implementation uh, of ultra-accommodative monetary policy and fiscal policy, 
is inflation a fear? Or by contrast, it should be viewed as a desirable, even if sometimes it is very hard to achieve, uh, means of dealing uh, with debt, public debt in, in, in particular. All these being seen in the broader uh, context of, uh, of a global economy that is changing as a result of the, uh, of the pandemic, the growth model uh, under undertaking uh, geostrategical consideration driven uh, changes uh, and uh, changes driven by the, uh, the pandemic such as remote uh, uh, place work, etc., etc., and the green transition being another theme. How will the European economy fare in this new uh, changing landscape? I'll try to describe in, uh, in, 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 uh, very briefly some of the elements of what this session uh, might contain, but this by no means an exhaustive uh, uh, list. Uh, panelists uh, with me today are, are, as I said before, eminent personalities of European policymaking in the academia, and obviously their, uh, their views on these topics are of utmost importance uh, for our audience. I would suggest uh, an initial statement of, let's say, eight to seven minutes uh, by each panelist in order to leave some time for the discussion uh, afterwards. Uh, so allow me now to begin with our first uh, uh, panelist, uh, Mr. Jean-Claude Trisset. Mr. Trisset doesn't need any special introduction. I think everybody is, is familiar with him. His present uh, uh, capacities include that of the European Chairman of the Trilateral uh, Commission, Honorary Governor of the Banque de France, Chairman of the, bon uh, the Board of Directors of Bruegel uh, Institute, Member of the Institute of France, and obviously, before that, in a glorious career, Mr. Jean-Claude Trisset has been, uh, has been uh, the President of the European Central Bank between 2003 and 2011. Previously, he has been Governor of uh, the Banque de France, Under Secretary of the French uh, uh, Treasury, President of the Paris Club, President of the European Monetary Committee, so on and so forth. Please uh, let me uh, pass the floor to him uh, and uh, delay no further. Mr. President, the floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Anastasatos. Uh, uh, you've been a little bit too flattering. I know that it is the law, law of the genre, la loi du genre, but I, I am only honorary chair of the Bruegel Institute. The new chair uh, is... Uh, replaced me recently and uh, uh, I want to say him hello and I, I didn't want to uh, to take back its, this position. Thank you very much again for your presentation. It's a pleasure to be with uh, Pierre Gramenga and Maria de Mertzis, which I, I uh, have known, of course, uh, uh, very, very much in the past for Maria and from time to time with Pierre. Uh, in this uh, very short initial statement, I would like to stress three elements that are associated with the uh, present crisis, the dra most dramatic crisis, I would say, since 2930s in the former century. And these three dimensions have, of course, a global dimension and a European dimension. First, I would say the present crisis is a formidable wake-up call. Second, it's a uh, uh, way of helping discovering weaknesses, deep weaknesses that we had in our economy, still have. And third, it is a formidable accelerator, accelerator of underlying trends in all economies, in the global economy, and of course in Europe. So first, a wake-up call. It's clear that we just discovered that on top of en uh, environment, on top of financial stability, on economic stability, which were recognized global public goods with the, I would say, progressive understanding that environment was of the essence and that uh, the previous uh, crisis of uh, Lehman Brothers uh, showed us that financial stability was also extraordinarily important. Uh, then we had neglected pandemics. Clearly, we were not trying to prevent seriously such a pandemic, we were not prepared for the pandemic. And uh, I would say that uh, one of the wake-up call that is the most important is forget about uh, my country first or even my continent first. It's not the way we can deal with global public goods. And uh, uh, I have to say that, uh, uh, of course, from this standpoint, the fact that the uh, 
most important economy in the world today uh, is no more in the camp of my country first or my continent first is very very important <clears throat> multilateral cooperation is of the essence seen from from the european standpoint of course it is very very uh, important we we are a model in a way for multilateral governance and uh, i think it's extremely important to consider that the present crisis the present crisis of a uh, major global public good uh, is reinforcing uh, our own uh, i would say way of uh, dealing with what is important at national level but also very important at multilateral level second dimension discovery the uh, crisis helped us discovering that we were in a situation which was uh, very weak from the economic standpoint from the uh, i would say financial standpoint we had this crisis which was not was neither economic nor financial but uh, nevertheless the worst crisis you could imagine with the potential absolute drama of uh, <clears throat> not only an enormous recession but a depression and uh, uh, one thing i would like to underline is that it is true that before the covid 19 we were in a situation which was weaker than the situation before lehman brothers we had uh, central banks with less room for maneuvering ex ante and uh, governments with much more uh, debt outstanding at a global level at the level of the advanced economy and at the level of national economy than it was the case with lehman brothers of course we could cope with this situation with uh, extraordinary boldness and extraordinary activism legitimate from the central banks and from the governments but it was a pity that we came to this dramatic crisis with so low room for maneuvering i would say both again on the fiscal side and on the monetary policy side uh, the reason of that was that the uh, a lot of economies certainly practically all advanced economies are not functioning normally we are not functioning normally since uh, the great financial crisis we had abnormal functioning low growth low productivity progress very low inflation with the risk of materialization of the deflationary risk uh, that is uh, something which the central banks of course uh, engineered to protect us from but of course it called for <clears throat> very high level of accommodation from the central banks legitimate but but extremely high i computed that uh, only in three country three economies us the uh, euro area and japan the accumulation of additional purchases of tradable securities was something like nine trillion uh, nine trillion dollars say 7.5 trillion euros in between the two crises not in the occasion of the crisis themselves but in between the two crises and that is coming from abnormal functioning of the advanced economy so hard work to do and for europe uh, certainly structural reforms remain of the essence in my own understanding to put productivity growth progress at a higher level to get out of the very low growth we have observed as uh, uh, our moderator just said and uh, to avoid the permanent obligation to be very accommodating in order to avoid the materialization of the deflationary risk so a lot of hard work to do from that standpoint i would say in the advanced economy and particularly at the european level and the last point uh, dimension of the covid crisis acceleration the covid 19 crisis uh, acts as an accelerator uh, it spurs uh, digitalization it spurs the green change green transition it spurs inclusiveness in our economies in our societies and this is true for all it seems to me and particularly also of course for europe but for europe it spurs the european construction itself because again we have <coughs> an occasion of uh, advancing as it is done by Europe in any such circumstances. The next generation EU that you mentioned, Mr. Uh, 
Anastasatos uh, is extremely important from that standpoint. It's a, I would say, emblematic illustration <coughs> of the necessity for Europe to deepen its own construction. And I am optimistic in this respect, I have to say, because all what I have observed in the past is that at each new challenges that Europe has, and that the world has, and Europe has, of course, a major advanced economy in the world, uh, we found ways to proceed. And uh, this, as I said, next generation EU is a uh, <coughs> very, very important uh, illustration, um, emblematic illustration of this acceleration, necessary acceleration, in my view, of the European integration, of the European construction. That was uh, my very brief first remarks, uh, Mr. Anastasatos. Uh, remarks as always. I, I, I keep your last remark about, uh, about uh, Europe always finding ways to, to go ahead, even if with some delays at some time, and perhaps we'll have the opportunity to discuss about that later on uh, in the panel. So uh, allow me now uh, to pass the floor to, uh, to our uh, next uh, distinguished uh, speaker, Mr. Pierre Gramegna, Minister uh, of Finance uh, of Luxembourg. Uh, Mr. Uh, Gramegna uh, was uh, firstly appointed in the ministerial position in 2013 and again reappointed uh, in uh, 2018. Uh, during his, his long time, he has seen uh, a, a decision making at the top European level by participating uh, in the uh, policy making bodies uh, in, in, uh, in Brussels. He has been the promoter of major reforms both domestically and at the European level, including uh, the uh, balancing of, uh, of the budget and the alignment of Luxembourg's tax rules with the national transparency standards, uh, the promotion of the sovereign fund for the benefit of future generation, promotion of fintech, sustainable finance, uh, so on uh, so forth. So I, I will try to explain, uh, to, ex uh, to exploit, excuse me, the, uh, the uh, unique uh, experience of uh, Minister Gramenias uh, on uh, our European policy making to, to ask him uh, some question beyond the generic remarks I did in, uh, in my initial, uh, in my initial comment uh, regarding the availability of fiscal space, the role of NGU and the potential uh, precursor of fiscal integration, so on and so forth. So, Minister, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Ms. Anastasos. Uh, I'm glad to be uh, in the panel with Jean-Claude de Trichet and uh, Maria de Mertzis. Uh, uh, let me first uh, uh, highlight that I would have preferred to, to be in Delphi, uh, in Delphi uh, where we normally should have this forum, uh, and maybe that would have helped us have a clearer view on the future because that, that's what uh, Delphi st stands for uh, in, in, in the history uh, of Greece and, and uh, of our civilization. And it also illustrates the fact that uh, Greece, like many other countries, is suffering uh, from the pandemic in a particular way, because tourism is limited, because traveling is limited. Let me therefore tell you that I, I really regret not to be able to be in your beautiful country and that I therefore put on a shirt that has the colors uh, of your flag. Uh, because uh, Greece is a country I, I love, I've visited many times, and Greece has been uh, in, in the heart of the discussions of the Eurogroup since 2013, many times and you rightly pointed out that uh, I was associated uh, to that and was always advocating that we should find solutions uh, with uh, the budget issues uh, on Greece and we finally did. Um, this being said, and been now eight years in the Eurogroup, I'm now the Dean of the uh, Eurogroup, a lot has happened in these eight years. Let me maybe make three larger points. First, uh, that uh, the context uh, of this crisis. Uh, many people say uh, that uh, this uh, economic crisis due to the pandemic is the deepest ever uh, or since maybe 1929. Uh, I beg to a little bit disagree. It is the, the deepest, but it's more than deepest, it's the most sudden. And uh, I think it's going to be V-shaped 
And so it will be sudden and will not last as long as others. It will definitely not last as long as the 2008 crisis, and it will not last uh, as long as the one in the 20s, which, by the way, is really good news. Now, uh, why is that? Uh, because there was an exterior factor prov prov provoking this crisis. That's the first reason. The second one is because we have the vaccines. Let's rejoice that in, in a very short amount of time, uh, vaccines were produced, uh, mainly uh, uh, through the initiatives of the private sector that has worked well um, and much faster than expected. What has the pandemic shown? Well, it has shown lots of weaknesses of our uh, economies. Uh, like Jean-Claude Trichet rightly said, banks uh, were in much better health uh, in 2020 than they were in 2008. And so banks and financial players were part of the solution to get out of the crisis. Let's not forget that uh, beyond the, the governments and states that really uh, uh, lavishly uh, mobilized uh, enormous sums of money to offset the economic consequences of the pandemic. Uh, so the pandemic was a, a, a revealing element. It showed us the weaknesses of our economies and it was a catalyzer. Let me just say a few words on this. It was a catalyzer in the sense that it, it uh, um, showed that those who are still skeptical about climate change are wrong. What do I mean? Well, uh, when uh, the economies uh, went more slowly, uh, were in fact uh, in a lockdown, well, we saw that the planet was breathing better. So it is human activity that is uh, responsible for uh, the climate change. And this is just a life-size test that we have witnessed. And so we must act and act quickly according to the Paris uh, Convention. The second thing it showed is that digitalization is not only a nice to have, it is a must and it's part of the solution. So um, let me uh, also highlight a, a last thing, uh, and which is really good news coming back to climate change, is that the United States are back in the game to protect the planet and that multilateralism is back uh, at a global level. And that's really key. Uh, even China uh, on the point of climate change has subscribed to some very important goals, which is carbon neutrality by 2060, which is 10 years later than, than the European Union and the US, but it's, it's at, at least a, a strong commitment too. Let me then come to European solidarity, my second point. I'm not going to, to go into the details of all the things that have been decided. I remember the night of the 9th of April when we decided uh, about uh, the, the three uh, pronged answer with European Investment Bank, with uh, uh, the, the ESM, European Stability Mechanism, and especially the SURE program to finance short labor uh, in, in many European countries. And then uh, in July, the uh, Resilience uh, and uh, um, Relaunch Fund, the RRF, RRF of 750 billion. So there was a European answer, it was fast. Uh, uh, and it showed a solidarity that I would never have expected. Uh, to tell you the truth, if someone had told me uh, in January of 2020 that something like that would be possible, I, I would have doubted it. And as Jean-Claude Trichet rightly said, when there's a crisis, fortunately, Europe reacts. And this solidarity is unheard of uh, at European Union level. And there's no more integrated area in the world than uh, the European Union. Let's not forget that we have given a lending capacity to the Commission on behalf of the whole European Union, which is a complete uh, innovation. Uh, um, and uh, that's, let's say, the monetary, the uh, kind of uh, amount of money that has been mobilized. But more importantly, I would like to highlight the fact that the Commission, together with the Member States, has uh, focused on the fact that th this money should be used wisely and should be used on investment dealing with sustainability and climate change on one hand and uh, with the digitalization on the other hand. So these uh, 750 billions of the resilience uh, fund uh, should not be used to cover running costs. And I think it is key that the implementation of this happens smartly, diligently, and effectively so that uh, we achieve uh, that uh, transition. Same goes for digitalization. Now, in terms of uh, digitalization, it's clear that Europe is 
far behind uh, the United States and, and Asia and particularly uh, uh, Japan and, and China. So we really need to catch up uh, in that area and these European funds will play an important role uh, in that context. Con concerning sustainable, uh, sustainability of growth, climate change issues, I think Europe is ahead of the others. We have developed many more solutions. We are also far ahead in um, sustainable finance, an area where Luxembourg is also playing an important role. As an example, let me give you the fact that more than half of all the green bonds in the world are listed at the Luxembourg Stock Exchange. Now, that sounds like this is a lot, but you must realize that green bonds today account for only less than 5% of all bonds that are issued worldwide. So we need to do much more in that area. And uh, let's realize that if there's one area where the euro is number one in the world, it is for sustainable finance. So let's build uh, on that. And uh, why is this double transition so important, uh, uh, digital and uh, uh, climate? because that's how we're going to increase our productivity. We have a lack of productivity in Europe and we must make sure we achieve that. And that's why the, the, the relaunch, uh, uh, the revival of the European economy is a qualitative one. It's based on qualitative investments. It is not based on the kind of general effort supporting demand and, and consumption which is also happening, but indirectly. So our policy is different from that of the United States uh, in, in, in that respect. And then my third point, which probably is going to be a, of, a, of lots of interest to you when we, we look ahead, will the rules on the stability and growth have now been put into brackets for the year 2020, 2021 and 2022 eventually? That decision for 2022 is not taken yet looks quite likely. Uh, um, so once this escape clause uh, is not used anymore, will we use the stability and growth pact? And I think we should learn, um, learn the lessons of the 2008 crisis, uh, learn the lessons of this pandemic uh, and uh, uh, do some smart adjustments to it. Certainly not throw the stability and growth pa um, pact overboard, certainly not but adjust it. And I would just like to, to give one hint in that direction. I think that we should transform the Stability and Growth Pact into a Growth and Stability Pact. In 2008, we were too fast to try to get uh, budgetary discipline back. Maybe we had no choice because the, the banks were very weak uh, and, and there were lots of other issues and, and the interest rates were high at that time or higher certainly than today, maybe we had no choice, but uh, this time uh, we must not repeat that uh, mistake. And in fact, we are not repeating it because the um, focus on investment is a policy that is uh, supported by all the member states, by the European Commission, by the IMF, by the OECD. All international institutions are of the opinion that we must get out of this short but deep recession through qualitative investment. And then the last uh, point in this context of the future and uh, low interest rates, that was the right policy of the European Central Bank. This uh, very low interest rate policy was already in place, so we had not a lot of room of maneuver there, but the European Central Bank could, in terms of quantities, buy more, uh, not do so much on the rate, and that was also very welcome. The discussion we will have in the future is about inflation. You mentioned that, um, Tassos, uh, uh, should we have a target? Uh, I think one must probably look at inflation in a, in a different way than we have done in the past, because inflation is always measured only on consumer goods. But uh, uh, what very low interest rates produce is that assets are being valued more and more, uh, and this is not taken into account, and this is a reason for uh, an, an increase of the poverty gap in many countries. So this is a complicated uh, issue. And I know, for example, that the Bank of New Zealand has started, the Central Bank of New Zealand has started to look at uh, land inflation in a wider context. Maybe that's a topic that we can address uh, um, that one and many others uh, later in the panel. I look forward to it and I hope I have partly answered your question.
Thank you, Minister. It uh, has been a very interesting uh, uh, conversation. And uh, I'll now pass very quickly, for the sake of time, to our next panelist, uh, Mrs. Maria De Mergi. Um, Ms. De Mergi is uh, a Deputy Director at the uh, Bruegel Institute. In her uh, distinguished career, she has held uh, both academic and uh, positions, as well as uh, policy-making uh, operations in the Dutch Central Bank. Uh, she has held uh, teaching posts at Harvard uh, uh, University and Strathclyde University in the UK, so on and so forth. So I'll try to exploit Mrs. Uh, Damarji's dual viewpoint as both an academic and uh, a, a policymaker to ask her some additional questions regarding the, uh, the uh, possibility of zombification of the European economy due to the reliance to cheap, uh, to cheap credit by monetary uh, 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 policy, uh, as well uh, as uh, the, the question of debt sustainability, which may not be an immediate point of focus at the moment, but perhaps uh, when monetary policy gets to, uh, to be more normal, uh, will be in our minds again. So, Ms. Demerji, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Tasha. It's a real uh, pleasure to uh, to be uh, involved in this uh, discussion with such a distinguished panel, of course. Uh, also, it's wonderful to go last because then I, I have a lot to uh, uh, to think about uh, from what I heard from my uh, my previous speakers. Um, I would like to. Uh, uh, perhaps uh, zoom in on a few of the issues that you raised at the beginning, Tassos. There's a very, very, very big discussion and we don't have uh, the possibility of talking on all of them. But there are a few things I would like to uh, to pick on and also in an attempt to answer to your very specific questions and also react to some of the issues that uh, that I heard uh, um, so far. There is, there is really three points that I would like to uh, zoom in. Um, the first one is the macro outlook. Uh, what do we learn uh, right now and how can policy react on the macro side. Then uh, I'd like, I can't resist the temptation of say something about the revisions of the macro framework because we are in a unique position right now where both the monetary framework as well as the fiscal framework um, are being discussed. Um, and therefore, maybe here some 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 thoughts on, on how perhaps we can think about reforming them would be uh, useful. And then, of course, I'll come to some of the issues that you also raised, uh, Tassos, on the zombification and what really happens next in the European economy, in the global economy. So let me start with the macro outlook, the inflation and the fiscal uh, outlooks. Uh, the discussion, of course, is very on the inflation side is very much motivated by what's going on in the US right now. Massive fiscal impulses. Will we see uh, inflationary reactions to that or not? The conversation has also uh, uh, translated into Europe. Uh, big disagreements as to whether we will see inflation or not as a result of these fiscal impulses. Uh, I basically look at the markets, and if you look at the markets uh, and ask them, uh, how do you operate given the current fiscal stimulus across the world, the markets are not very worried. The expectations of inflation, both in the US and in the EU, in the Eurozone, are very tamed, and they're certainly not seeing um, exorbitant raises on, on prices that are, uh, that are dangerous. Now, um, that doesn't mean that the fiscal responses that we've seen are small. There is a possibility of inflation uh, picking up. Even if it were to pick up, at least certainly in the context of the US, there is space for accommodating that simply because the US has now moved into a system of average inflation targeting. And having had inflation being tamed for and very, very low for a long time, it has the space not to do anything for some time. So if I, personally, I don't believe inflation is, uh, is a problem, uh, certainly not in the US. Uh, in the in the EU and in the euro area in particular, again, inflation expectations are not showing us any signs of, uh, of worry. Uh, however, uh, there is an issue here which I would like to, to point out, and that is the following. If inflation were to pick up, and what I mean by picking up, I mean systematically pick up, so sustainably, uh, on the one hand, that would be good news because it would demonstrate that the economy is actually now booming. So in that respect, it's not such a bad idea to see a little bit of inflation because it will be a sign of the economy actually being greased in the wheels. And I think that's not such a bad idea. However, if this inflationary 
uh, pressures were to be sustained, the ECB would probably have to do something about it. Uh, and that would mean increase uh, interest rates. That's not so good news, actually. And they're not so good news for two reasons. Um, the first one is that there is a, a very unique phenomena in, in the Eurozone, which is not relevant in other countries, but it is relevant in, in the context of the European continent. And that is the financial fragmentation. Uh, some of the policies that the ECB has put in place right now are not just motivated from a monetary policy point of view, they're also motivated for allowing the system to be non-financially fragmented. And that, of course, is, is useful in the, in the context of countries being able to finance uh, the very big expenses that they're having to finance as a result of the pandemic. If they had to increase uh, um, uh, interest rate, that is going to put a split in the way that the ECB approaches its policy. On the one hand, obliged to react to inflation by increasing uh, interest rates. On the other hand, um, uh, split in its, in its wish uh, to try and prevent financial fragmentation. So that would not be a good, uh, good news. And of course, the other obvious one is that we are starting from a point of view of high indebtedness and therefore increasing the interest rate is going to add uh, on, the, on the burden. So in the context of the EU, the possibility, even though I do not believe that inflation is in, in our radar for the moment, if it were to appear, it it would, it would put the ECB in a rather uh, awkward position. That's, uh, that's one thing. On the, on the fiscal side, of course, uh, as previous panelists have said, we are in a very highly indebted position now. Um, the space is much smaller than it ever was. Um, and therefore, you know, any possibility of using the fiscal space anymore uh, is uh, ever increasingly decreasing. And that, of course, is an issue. That brings me to my second point of how to think about reforming the frameworks with which we apply fiscal and monetary policy. And let me start with the fiscal one. When the current fiscal framework was created when the in the current 90s, fiscal framework was created in the 90s. This can you hear me well? Wrap up can you in hear a, me in well? a minute if possible. Hello? Oh, is that okay? Can you hear me? Oh, is that okay? Can you hear me? Yeah, pl pl I was just uh, asking you uh, if you can wrap up in, in a minute because we're running out of time. Yeah, can you hear me there? Uh, I'm sorry, but I can yeah, hear you can double. Can you hear me there? Uh, I'm sorry, but I can, can hear I can... you double. And I can... I don't know if the studio okay. can help there. I don't know if the studio can help. Hello? Can you hear me? I can hear you, but I can hear myself as well. I can hear you as well. Okay, okay. So I, I, was, I, I was asking you to, to wrap up, but uh, I'm afraid we ran out of time. So if you have a last point to make uh, in, in a minute or so. Or... Can you hear me? So anyway. Um... Can you hear me? I, I'm afraid. I'm afraid this technical uh, technical problem just uh, took away our last minute. So I would have to wrap up the session. I hope this uh, has been food for thought uh, for an early uh, start of the day, uh, with the with the risk of doing injustice to the wealth of arguments uh, heard to the session. Let me iterate one point that I think can be uh, a point of consensus for all uh, for all speakers: the need to engineer quick and sustainable growth uh, via the combination of the efficient use of funds as well as uh, bold structural uh, reforms. This is key not just to reclaiming the losses in incomes and employment incurred by the pandemic, but also for, for, for ensuring uh, sustainability. Hopefully we'll have the time, the next time, perhaps in person uh, next year in Delphi to discuss again about this, uh, these issues in a much improved uh, European economy. Thank you very much for participating uh, and uh, hope to see you again uh, very soon. Good morning.